up your Bibles. How many of y'all brought your Bibles? Y'all came to church this morning. Bring your Bibles. Dust it off. Take off those rider webs. Come on now. Mark chapter 2, verse 13. And I want to give you a little story uh, about uh, when I went to India. We're talking about our commitment to discipleship. And I want to share a little story. Uh, back in 2011, uh, a group of us, Pastor Joe, uh, Pastor Nancy, myself, uh, and Christina, uh, we had traveled across the sea, okay? And we went over to India, and I remember I had never been to a place like India. Okay, I've been to Puerto Rico, I've been to Mexico, but this was something totally different. And I went out there, I remember like the first couple of days I got sick, I started losing some weight. I had to get adjusted to the food. I'm just like, dear Lord, how are you going to use me while I'm out here? And, and as I got better, we went and traveled down to southern India. And I remember at that point in time, Pastor Nancy uh, was becoming a little ill. And that day, we were going to be going out to the villages. And Pastor Joe, like any good pastor, comes out to me. Hey, son, you know, guess what? I'm like, what? You're going to be preaching today. Oh, you just told me right now. I got to get ready. He's like, no, no. God's going to give you a word. And I'm like, amen. So we're in the car. We're traveling. I'm like going through my Bible like, God, I got to speak to these people. Like, I'm not from here. How am I going to relate to them? What can I tell them that they can understand that I know what they're going to in the turn of Jesus? You think it might be as simple as say, hey, live for Jesus, but it's not. Because sometimes they can look at you and be like, you don't know nothing about me. How can you say that? As a matter of fact, you ever told somebody about something like you think, you, like, man, I know what you're going through. Let me tell you about this. And they come back and tell you, like, listen, it's not like that. And so I'm over there, and these people that, like, third world countries, I don't know what it's like. And I'm praying, like, God, Holy Spirit, give me a word. And I'm over here driving, and we're in the car. And, and I remember the Lord leading me to this passage in Mark 2, chapter 13. And, and it was as simple as this. Me, Mexican, Puerto Rican, all right, you know what, grew up in Humble Park, went to Lane Tech, played baseball. They don't got baseball over there. I'm like, you guys play baseball? I couldn't use any sports analogies because I love doing that. You know, I was giving some help saying, you know, talk about farming because they have that agriculture. That's their economy. And I was like, okay. But the Lord led me to this passage. Let's go ahead and read in Mark 2, 13. It starts off like this. The calling of Levi. Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him, and he began to teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting next to the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him. He said, follow me. And Levi got up and followed him and I remember when the Lord brought me to this passage God spoke to my heart the father said listen I want them to be my disciples I want them to know it's a wholehearted commitment in following me tell them that tell them that and I started beginning to realize God I trust you I didn't know many examples I, I'll try to be funny but that wouldn't work and I remember the Lord using that because God in his word, he says he wants to make disciples of all nations. And the Holy Spirit was going out and touching people's lives. And I'll tell you what, our commitment to discipleship is not just simply because our church says so, because we say it every morning on the, on the screen. It's because God, his heart, the Father's heart, he desires it for you. Amen. I want to give you a working definition of what a disciple is. Because in our understanding, I think that many of us have the wrong definition of what a disciple is. You see, when we come to Christ and when we come to church, we get excited. We fall in love with Jesus. We see that our sins keep us separated from him, and we give our lives to Christ. Amen. If you've given your life to Christ by a loud shout on the count of three, I want you to say amen. One, two, three. Amen, amen, amen. amen. So we've given our life to Christ. Now what? Now what? You see, now today in the church, we, we kind of equivocate that being a disciple means you attend a lot more functions. Like, I'm going to go to the barbecue, I'm a disciple. I'm going to go to the, the, the softball game, I'm a disciple now. And I want to give you this definition of what a disciple is. Biblically, it says, becoming a complete and competent follower of Jesus Christ. It is about being and reproducing spiritually mature zealots for Christ spiritually mature zealots you get excited about Jesus that when you come in here you know that man you know what before the pastor says anything before the worship starts God is living inside of me and I'm meeting with the body of believers and he's wanting to do something that I'm going to grow that I'm not going to say this is where I'm at because of x y and z but God has something for me and he wants me to grow amen 
There's two processes. When you think about discipleship, I'm going to give it to you like this. And if you're taking notes, you can write it down. I don't have any notes for you on the screen. It's all here in the pad. So if you guys just hit listen up and take good notes, you guys can catch it. Here's the first thing. The process involves two complementary components. Number one, becoming a committed, knowledgeable, practicing follower of Jesus. Let me ask you something. Are you practicing following Jesus? You know, I remember I played baseball for about 12 years in my life. And, you know, in order for me to say I'm a baseball player, I'm good at it, I know how to play the game, it's because I practice. It's because I'm devoted to it. I wake up early, practice after, I stay afterwards, and, and I take more ground balls, and I, and, I, and I work on my stance and my swing. And, and let me ask you something. Being a disciple isn't simply coming to a church or midweek service or wearing a cross around your neck. Hello, somebody. Come on. It means becoming a committed, knowledgeable, practicing follower of Jesus. The second thing in this process, what this means, is instilling that same passion and capacity in others. Come on now. When people look at you, do they see Jesus? Because coming a tr Christian, you know what that word means? We can, somehow, and, and, and today in the church, we've kind of like, it's, it's become diluted. Being a Christian means being Christ-like. So that when you go back to your families, you go into your work, or wherever you may be, do people see Christ? Are they saying, like, man, the old person, who you were, that's, that's something. You're, I don't know who you are anymore. That's Jesus. How about this? Instilling that same passion and capacity in others. How is that going? I want to break it down for you very slowly using the word of God. And I believe that God, what he wants to do, is he wants to bring that passion in being a disciple. It isn't just because Metro Praise International, we have that and we want to be a, a power hungry. We want to tell you what to do. No, no, it's God's heart. It's his vision for you. Amen? Amen. There's a history of discipleship. Here we go. Jesus gives the call to become his disciple. If you guys can open up your Bibles to Matthew 4, 18. And I'm going to open mine with you. Matthew 4, 18. Good thing you guys brought your Bibles. We're going to be using it. Going to get into it. Amen. Hallelujah. Matthew 4, 18, the calling of the first disciples. Amen. It says it like this. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Here are two guys. They're fishing. That was their job. For all of their life, they were providing for their family. They were decent, good men. Here comes Jesus alongside verse 19, come follow me. That's it. I love Jesus. Jesus keeps it simple. He doesn't say, hey, look, attend this, do this, do this, jump around, fight. He doesn't say that. He says, come follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. Verse 20, I love this. At once, somebody say at once. Come on. At once, they left their nets and followed him. Come on, we got to be just like the disciples in the Bible. Come on, when we come to church, it's not one of these things where we fold our hands and say, I ain't ready for that. No, 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 no. What do they do? They said, at once they left their nets and followed him. What's holding you back from following Jesus? He's already made the call. If you've already heard the gospel presentation, Christina did an excellent job today. And if you're hearing it, say, man, you know what? I'm not ready for that. At once they followed, they left their nets and they followed him. Wow. That's not me, yo. That's the Bible. Open up your Bibles to Mark 3, 13 through 19. The call. This is the call. God is calling people. See, what's changed from back then to today? What's changed? Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. Praise God. Amen. Mark 3, 13. Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed the twelve, designated them apostles, that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and have authority to drive out demons. And onwards, you can read the list of men. Let me tell you what, the call of God is going out to you today. If you look through the Bible, discipleship is not this one thing where we say, hey, listen, we want people to come to church. We want our church to get bigger and say, we're going to call it discipleship because we want everybody to join our club. If, if you guys are thinking that someone like, man, I don't want to join their club. Sometimes we, we treat the church as if it's a club, and I'm just not ready for that. It's Jesus Christ. He's giving the call, and he's saying, listen, this is what I want you to be. Amen? 
And Jesus sends out the disciples. You know that when Jesus was here in the earth, even in his earthly ministry, he sent out his disciples. That's what it's about. A disciple, someone who's committed, following Jesus, and then doing the same, reproducing themselves. We're going to go to Matthew 28. And this is actually a a famous passage in the Bible when it talks about, you know, uh, the discipleship, the great commission, what it's called. Matthew 28. We'll start in verse 16. Hallelujah. Matthew 28, verse 16, as I get there. Here it is. The Great Commission. Come on now. It says like this. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Somebody say go. Go. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end end of the age. I love this. Before, I'm going to give you the picture of what's happening. Jesus has risen from the dead. He's alive. He's still alive today, y'all. Just we read in the Bible, that's, it's true. He's alive, and he's telling his disciples before he goes back in heaven and glory, he says, listen, I want you guys to go. And what does he tell them afterwards? Go and make disciples of all nations. Disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. You see, when you read the Bible and you look at Jesus' call, and then you see the church today, something went wrong. See, in our minds, we kind of now think that discipleship is a program. Discipleship is a lifestyle. See, Jesus calls you to be saved, to become a disciple, not to join a program or a mentorship. Jesus called you to be. As a matter of fact, to be a Christian means to be a disciple. Let me ask you, how is it going? How is it going? The church today, I'm going to give you some stats. George Barna is a man who has done some great research, and this was a survey conducted with over 1,000 believers nationwide. Not just here in this city, but major cities in Illinois and even small towns. And, and he goes out and conducted this survey. And it's surprising to see these results. Sometimes they're unsettling, but this is the church today. We have to realize, man, God is calling us to something greater. How serious are believers about spiritual growth? This was the question. And they went around. They had these certain surveys. And these are the results. 52% say they have consistent effort with limited returns. What that means is means even though work, even though they work at spiritual growth consistently, they have not reached the level of maturity or commitment to maturity that they would like. 52% of believers say I'm being consistent, but I'm not where I'm at yet. 20% say they have inconsistent effort with limited returns. Same thing. I'm not where I'm at. I'm inconsistent. I'm not. Well, hello. <laughs> you're not consistent. You're not where you're at. Well, something's up. 18% say, only 18%, check this out, only 18% said they're most serious about their commitment in their life. 18% of believers that were surveyed. Can it be said about this here in the church right now that only 18% of people here are really wholeheartedly committed about Jesus? That it's not just coming to a Sunday, but that when they go home, it's spiritually developing more and more into Christ. 18% only. And 10% of believers, check this out, said they give no effort and no interest. 10%. 10%. The reasons why believers are not more zealous about discipleship, here they are. Two-thirds said that they were too busy to give the process the time it requires. Is that you this morning? Is there something more important than getting to know Jesus more in a relationship and intimacy? Is something coming before that? Two-thirds said that they are too busy to give the process the time it requires. How about this? One quarter said the general lack of interest or motivation to grow. I'm just not interested. Jesus, I'm cool with him saving me. I got the ticket to heaven. I'm great. I'm good. I'm not interested in doing anything else. Just leave me alone. One ten said that they suffered from personal limitations such as emotional or financial problems. And one ten cited health problems as their barrier. If you can do me the favor, you can get the vision and the strategy up on the board for me, please. 
all of them, when you look back and you look at the readings or even the findings of what happened, all of them underscore one path. I mean, one, one giant thing stands out. A lack, a, des- a lack of desire to be godly. That's what it boils down to. Is it isn't about like, man, I, I love Pastor Joe's preaching. Man, I love the worship. Man, I love, com- no, no, no. It's a lack of passion to be godly. Ask yourself that question today, that in your heart, without me having to say, are you back home? Are you throughout your entire week, not just Sundays or Wednesdays, midweek, not Christmas or Easter, throughout your life, are you passionate about being, about being more like Jesus? Is that coming forth in your walk, in your own devotional time? Or are you too busy? I, said, I got this quote from Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He was a man of God uh, when World War II was coming out, a man, a theologian, a scholar, he was passionate and he was radical about Jesus. Hitler was the man condemning, even killing Jews. And this man came out and said, man, I'm going to live for Christ. And he was talking about making disciples in that time, all that persecution. He said this, Christianity without discipleship is always Christianity without Christ. Woo! I'm going to read that again. Christianity without discipleship is always Christianity without Christ. You see, we have the, the vision here, loving God, loving people, but our strategy, connect. Who are we connecting to? You're surely not connecting with us. We hang out together. But we want to connect you to Jesus, mentor you, and then send you out. A lack of passion to be godly. I have 10 questions. I'm just going to read them out. And this is what I want to do. I'm going to read them out slowly. I'm going to read it out clear. And I want you to see if the Lord brings up or highlights anything in your life about being a disciple. Here are 10 questions to see how you're doing in being a disciple. You ready? Number one, are you certain that your eternal salvation has been determined by your confession of sins and your acceptance of Christ's gift of forgiveness? Are you born again? Have you repented from your sins? Number two, do you consistently obey Jesus' teachings? Consistently. Not when you feel like it. Not because I'm mad he understands. No. Do you consistently obey Jesus' teachings? Number three, do you always love other people in practical ways, especially fellow followers of Christ? Are you picking who you're choosing to love? Man, that person doesn't dress the way I dress, so I'm not going to love them. Hello? Hello? Have we made this more of a social club and say, listen, I'm only cool with these people, but I can't love them because you're just weird. Look to your neighbor and say, you just weird. Don't believe him. Don't, don't say that. <laughs> don't say that in church, y'all. Do you love people in practical ways, especially other believers? Number four, have you put the attractions and distractions of this world in their proper place and focused on knowing, loving, and serving God? Are you too distracted? Is, is, does the shine of the world, does everything that the world has to offer is more important, has more glare, more focus in your life than Jesus? Number five, do you carry the burdens of following Jesus with joy? <laughs> Come on. I can tell you what, that when I gave my life to Christ and God called me into ministry, God is good. That does not change, okay? But what I'm about to say may scare you, okay? I don't want you guys to be scared. Like, he's a pastor. I love Jesus. I I give my life to him. Amen. But I'm going to tell you something. It's been hard, y'all, coming to Christ because the devil sees when you're committed and you're giving your life to Jesus, he's going to come and throw every distraction, everything in your way to get you off track. And I'll tell you what, there have been times when the car fails. There have been times when you're getting arguments with family, when times when friends leave you. And I'm saying, God, is this what you've called me to? And he says, yes, how about this? Do you carry the burdens of following Jesus with joy? And I remember in those times when the car doesn't work and I'm about to like, oh my gosh, God, I love you, God. My family's talking about me, but I love you. Come on now, with joy. Come on, number six, do you live in such a way as to show others what the Christian life looks like? Or are you compromised when you go to work? Do you laugh at things that, in the church, if, if you were to hear that, would be like, man, that's not, that's not appropriate. Hello? Number six, do you live in such a way to show others what the Christian life looks like? Number seven, do you relate to other Christians consistently in a spiritual setting and for spiritual purposes? Do you come to church and you say, I ain't got time for that? Ain't no one got time for that coming to church? Uh-uh. They got the playoffs. I ain't got time for that, Jesus. You know better. 
Come on. You should know better. <laughs> that's, a, that's a quick rebuke in Jesus' name. But do you come together in a spiritual setting? Number eight, are you sharing your faith in Christ with those who have not embraced him as their savior? Do you share it? Or do you keep it to yourself? I remember this illustration. Imagine that you have the cure for cancer. You have the cure. Like you have to give it to someone and they no longer have. Imagine you having the cure for cancer and you not sharing it with anybody. You may know friends, you may know family that may have that and may suffer through that. And you're saying, I'm not going to give it to them. Jesus Christ gives the forgiveness of sins. But you not sharing it with others, hello, where are people going to go? Let's be honest. Let's just think like, oh, that's just their own thing. They will go to hell without Jesus. Do you share it with others? Number nine, are you helping others believe? Are you helping other believers grow spiritually? Are you coming alongside your fellow peers and your brothers and disciples saying, let's do this together? Man, I know what you're going through today. We prayed for Steph and the Santoyo family. Man, we got you. We got you. We're here for you. God has a plan for you. God loves you. Are you coming alongside? And number 10, do you consistently seek guidance from God in all you do? Do you consistently seek guidance from God? Hello? George Barna said this after conducting the research. He says, when you are a true disciple of Jesus Christ, you will bear fruit worthy of a follower of the risen Lord. Let me ask you, are you bearing fruit today? Are you bearing fruit? I think one of the reasons that we're so drawn back to discipleship, and partly because the church made it seem like it's a whole bunch of functions, it's not. It's the life he wants you to live. Really, that, that's what it boils down to. Connect, mentor, and send. We're just saying, hey, this is the practical way of doing it. When you come in here, we want God to take full advantage of you and send you and launch you out. We want your life to change. And this is the way we're going about it. See, it's not joining a softball ministry. Hello? It's not joining a cooking ministry. That's, it's not, that's, those things are good. But they don't take the place of knowing and growing spiritually in Christ. I want to give you Luke chapter 9. And we're going to be ending with this. Luke 9, and I'm going to take my time here, and, and, I, and I want to change and shift a little bit about some of the reasons why people don't go or people don't follow Christ. Luke 9, 57 through 62. Amen, Luke 9. Verses 57 through 62. The cost of following Jesus. Here it is. Being a disciple, our commitment to discipleship is because it's the Father's heart for us. Do you know that when Jesus was here on the earth, he says, I don't do nothing unless the Father tells me I do what the Father does. What do you think the Father wants for you? If Jesus was about making disciples... The Jesus is cool, but he's really on discipleship. He's really wanting to get buddy-buddy and really get into my life and really expose the hidden things. I'm not like that. I'm more like the Father. He's chill in heaven and glory, you know, in the worship. That's, that's me. Jesus did what the Father wanted him to do. So the Father's heart for you in this place is to be a disciple. Hello? I love this. Reading Luke 9, 57 through 62. I remember back in the day, first reading something like this. This is about to offend some people. I'm just going to give you, like, before I read it, this is going to offend you. And this is not because I'm trying to twist it to offend you, but Jesus Christ is saying this. Listen, this is what it takes. You want to follow me? This is what it takes. Are you guys ready for it this morning? It's the word of God. If you guys got the NIV, that's what I got. So you guys know I ain't tampered with it. I ain't trying to write my own version. Jesus Christ, here we go. The cost of following Jesus. Verse 57, as they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Let me paint a picture really quick before we get into it, okay? Jesus is with his disciples. Now here's some guy, he's probably hearing about Jesus. Man, you know what? This is the Messiah. He's done some crazy things like people have gotten off from their sick beds. People have been casted out, demons have been going, ah! they leave right and Jesus is doing it and they're like wow this man is a prophet this man is a man of God this one is someone different so they come and they come up to him and they say this in verse 57 I will follow you wherever you go and Jesus here we go verse 58 Jesus replied foxes have holes 
and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Let's keep on reading. Verse 59, he said to another man, follow me. But the man replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Verse 62, Jesus replied, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom. This is God's kingdom, this church, this is his body. This is the purpose for what we're here. Being a Christian essentially means to be a disciple. How is it going? Let's go back and look at these examples. Jesus says to the first man, Lord, I will follow you. In his mind, he's thinking like, I got this. But Jesus checks him. See, Jesus knew the underlying thing, the thing that was in his heart. He says, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He could have just simply said, hey, come on, drone on board. I want many people to follow me because if, if not a lot of people are following me, I'll get insecure and people won't know I'm the God. You know, then they won't believe me. He doesn't tell them that. He says, listen, you want to follow me? Listen, I, what it means to follow me, it doesn't mean that I'm going to come around recruiting people. We're going to take over this, this land because at that point in time, the Roman uh, army, the Roman government was in charge and control of, of Jerusalem. Jesus is saying, listen, it's not about that. You want to follow me? I'm living a life of, of, of being persecuted, of death, and giving my heart to the lost. Are you about that? Come on. Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Are you ready for this, he's saying. Verse 59, another man said, follow me. But the man replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Now when you read this passage, you kind of get the idea that, man, Jesus is being a little insensitive. Jesus, you don't know how, how much death hurts. Really, Jesus, you would tell somebody that? Just, just read that. Someone had died. A man comes up. Jesus, let me follow you. Okay, I, I believe you, you're, you're God. But first, I got to do this. You see, wait a minute. Wait, hold on. I got to first do this, God. You don't come first right now. This comes first. What is Jesus saying? Let the dead bury their own dead, but you proclaim the kingdom of God. See, if Jesus isn't first in your life, you see, you can't follow him. Jesus tells him, look, whoever puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not fit. Whoever, no one who puts his hand on the plow, rather, and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom. We read that, so I'm like, man, Jesus doesn't want anybody to be saved. Somehow in our mind, we get the idea like no one who puts his hand to the plow is qualified for the service in the kingdom. That's not what it's saying. Because you don't, no one can qualify for the kingdom of God. It's by grace. No one's better than the other. It's by grace. But the better word I would use here is probably useless. No one who puts his hands to the power, they become useless for service in the kingdom of God. Look at that. Man, going back to it, Jesus says, look, you want to put your family before me? Jesus, my career right now is taking off. I can't be committed to you. I can only give you Sundays. God, the rest of the week, I got to focus. I got to study. This can't come first, God. My career, my family, God, my kids, I want them to grow up so they can love you first. I'm going to spend all my time and energy in them. It can't happen like that. It can't. You really missed the point. He says, let the dead bury their own dead. Now, obviously, someone who is physically dead cannot dig a grave. Hello, somebody. You guys catch that? He said, let the dead bury their own dead. What's he talking about? You're spiritually dead. You see, anything that comes before Christ is an indicator. Like, man, I'm putting this before Christ. It's an indication of you being spiritually dead. It's the whole point. Jesus comes first. Following him wholeheartedly, committed to him. Jesus is saying that for everybody here in this place. If the band can come up, please. I believe one of the reasons why people, they're not committed to God in this sense of discipleship, spiritually maturing and sharing their faith, is because of a lack of passion to be godly. That's what it boils down to. All right, let's, let's just put this down. Let's just take away all the accolades that you might have. Let's just say that, you know what, man, all the years for church that you've been to don't count for nothing. All the camps that you've been to, all the songs that you sang count for nothing. Right now in your heart, are you desiring to grow spiritually in Christ? 
See, people can still come to service and get caught in this like trance and just like the repetitiveness of I'm going to church, I'm going to church, I'm going to church, I'm going to church, I'm going to church. But in your heart, are you desiring God spiritually? Like, I want to be more like you. But the distractions of the world are taking you away from Jesus. Come on. Are you saying to yourself, I want to be godly? I want to follow him. Or are you compromised? You see, Connect, Mentor, Sin wasn't something that we came up and like, man, this is a good idea. Connect, Mentor, Sin is what Jesus did. To be a disciple. You know what? Connecting to Jesus, everybody seems that they can do that. But it gets a little harder when you get mentored. Like, man, I, I don't want to be uh, that vulnerable. What do you think it was like for the disciples hanging around Jesus? Man, those guys were insecure. They had some problems, and Jesus was always dealing with it. But he had the grace and the passion to say, listen, you can do this. And those same men who were with Jesus for three years, and when Jesus died, they felt like, man, it's all over. Those same men, the Bible records, turned the world upside down for Jesus. It's because they were disciples being mentored and saying, God, you're in my life. I want people to be there with me so I can do this. And then being sent back out. See, if you're just hoping that your family will get saved and just praying, but you're not sharing it, hello, how are they going to know unless they don't hear? Who's going to tell them? I'm the only one saved with my family. Hey, that's a good place to start. But it starts with you becoming a disciple. You see, we have these things here in the church, the 101, the 201. It's our program. It's the way we do discipleship. But you see, Jesus himself, he's saying, listen, it's not just about the program. I'm checking your heart. Am I number one? So you can still do a program and still in your heart say, man, I'm not sure about this. God wants your heart. And see, and I believe when God has your heart, you can look at the Connect Mentor and say, and say God, I'm sold out to you. Because everything that we're getting here doesn't come from man-made principles. It's Jesus from the Father straight from the throne. This is my desire. It's my heart for you. If in your heart you're not getting excited for Jesus, that's a place to start. It's a place where you're spiritually dead. You're spiritually dead. Jesus told him, listen, if you can't put me first, you're not fit. You're useless. The healing power of the kingdom of heaven cannot flow through you. It's useless. It doesn't work when you want to at work. It works when you're committed. When you're following me through the good, through the bad. You follow me. Jesus is challenging you today in your commitment to him, in your commitment to being a disciple. Would you stand for me, please, and close him? Discipleship is not just for the spiritual elite, for the pastors or missionaries. Discipleship is the proof that we have the life of God in us and that we are indeed Christian. Hmm. I read this to you. No one but Christ himself can make the call to discipleship. The call for discipleship is never for this action or that action. It is always a call for or against Jesus Christ are you for Jesus Christ or you're against him listen I want to have the life group leaders come up here in just one second and we want to pray for you because it starts in your heart see we have a way of doing discipleship to help you out to come alongside it doesn't matter you've been here to church before I mean I, I my testimony was this I grew up in church godly family godly home and even at a young age memorizing scriptures I mean, back when I was in fourth grade, memorizing Psalms 1, you'd be able to say it and you'd be able to sing it. And, and I just remember, like, man, I, I thought I'm good with God. Then I noticed that growing up in different areas of my life suffered, and I wondered, man, where is the connect? And, and I gave my life back to God, and I was radical, and I had been a youth pastor previously coming here at another church, and I was serving there. And I'm saying, man, God, you're doing awesome things. And then I realized, man, I need to be mentored. I don't know it all. And so I came, I, I got plugged into to Metro Praise, and, you know, here was the 101 book. 
It's for, it's for people who really give their life to Christ for the first time and don't have an understanding maybe of what's going on in the Christian world, what God wants to do. But here I am as an ex-youth pastor saying, like, I've already done that. You know what came into my mind and my heart? I don't need this. <laughs> We're going to start back here at the basics? Dude, come on now. I, I grew up in church. You know what I mean? I was a youth pastor before I came here. And, but I remember at that point in time, God using that to check my heart to check my motives. And I remember at that point in time, God taught me a lot about myself that came through me submitting myself to what he has and God called me to. The call is going out today. He gave it in his word. He said, therefore, go. Ever since Jesus spoke it, the call was out. You're hearing it today. Will you respond?